Today on Anatomy of a Circuit Car, I'm here with this 2021 V8 Super Ute prototype. So Super Utes is a little bit like the American Truck Series. Um, you know, there's, there's the, the sedan series of V8 supercars in Australia, uh, just like NASCAR in America. Uh, young drivers will go from go-karts to maybe Toyota 86. Super Utes is the pathway from 86s to V8 supercars. Uh, the Super Utes originally started in 2018. Uh, it was a diesel platform and it originated because it was the most sold vehicle in Australia and manufacturers saw a need and a presence to be involved in Australian motorsport with the most sold vehicles. Now the biggest change in the 2021 season compared to the earlier seasons of the Ute series is the engine package. There's an LS in this one, it's gonna sound awesome, it's gonna blow flames out the side and it's gonna be exciting to watch. This thing is an LS3 series engine, but it's a parody style thing. So remembering that this is a stock engine, it's got a camshaft, it's got a set of valve springs, uh, it's got a trunnion set, it's got an underdrive balancer on the front. But other than that, this is a relatively standard engine and the guys have done that for a reason. They've done that so there's parody across the whole series. And yeah guys, we know, just another LS swap. Well, considering the size of this engine made, the width of it, the guys did look at the Coyote engine. It was physically too large to fit into some of the models of utes, remembering that it's not just the Mitsubishi, there's other utes in this series. The LS was a narrower, tidier package for this particular application, tried and tested. There's a huge amount of aftermarket support. Overall, for this particular setup, the LS3 was the right answer. This engine is, is uh, an LS3 based crate motor. Um, that comes through GM here in Australia, but we've taken that engine, we've added increased reliability and power to it. Um, we looked at the CT525 GM engine as a, as a benchmark because they're so widely used overseas with, uh, with a lot of different control categories, but we wanted to be able to offer that here with Australian companies and some New Zealand companies and some US companies with all the parts rolled into one and offer um, an engine that we can leave our shop every single time and know that it's going to be exactly the same. So we've added uh, a camshaft, a performance grind camshaft, very similar to the CT525. Uh, we've gone further and above and added uh, a heavy duty push rod. We've added double row timing chain set. We've added uh, a performance oil pump. We've added trunnion kits to the rockers, ARP bolts throughout. Um, some, some models need different sumps and baffles inside. Um, so yeah, a double valve spring. So there's a lot of changes that are completely different from a factory LS3 engine. There are six seals per engine. They get fitted in, in various spots throughout the engine to ensure that once it leaves here, there will no, be no changes done to the engine. And if there is a seal missing or it had to be broken at the track, then the, the officials will be notified and we can move forward from there. Something else to take note of in the engine bay, and there's a couple of them around, are these little testing seals. So this has got a name and a number on it and it's drilled through some of these bolts here that the idea is that you can't pull the engine apart without breaking this tag. So in the example here, these two bolts are holding the inlet manifold down and they're holding the fuel rail down. So in order to change any of that stuff, you would have to break this tie wire. Like any good circuit car, in here, it's all business. 
nice and simple. You can get to everything really easily. So we'll start at the front. It's got a K&N air filter that comes up through the intake pipe into the factory electronic throttle body. It's got an air temperature sensor here that's measuring the temperature of the air going into the engine. And that's for two reasons, or a couple of reasons. The first reason would be just measuring the inlet air temperature so we've got it in our data. The second reason is so that the tuner can build in any corrections based on that air temperature. So if you get stuck in traffic and there's a whole bunch of cars and being hot exhaust gases in front of it, things start to heat up. We can see there's the inlet air temperature starts to heat up so we can then build ignition corrections and fueling corrections in in order to keep the engine safe. Um, most importantly, the inlet air temperature sensor is used in part of the engine management system's fuel model. The air temperature plays a role in how much oxygen is in the air. So the colder inlet air temperature, the more dense the air is, the more oxygen there is, thus the more power we can make. Once the air goes in, factory intake manifold, straight through the engine, factory headers, and she's out. We look over to the front here, it's got a PWR radiator at the front. It's also got a PWR heat exchanger down the bottom here where engine oil goes into that heat exchanger and green coolant also goes into that heat exchanger. Obviously they don't mix, it's a, it's a fluid to fluid heat transfer. So what's happening there is as the engine warms up, the green coolant will get hotter than the oil initially. So that'll help to heat the oil up to get the engine up to operating conditions. Then when you're out on the racetrack, the oil temperature will typically be a little bit hotter than your coolant temperature. So having this heat exchanger here will allow us to get temperature out of the oil into the cooling system, then for the radiator to get rid of that temperature. How cool is that? Over in this corner, we've got our power steering reservoir. This looks like the factory one out of the factory Mitsubishi. And something that's extraordinary, over here, we've got the GM factory power steering pump. We've got this hose here, which is the factory hose of the Mitsubishi diesel engine. Everything mates just straight up perfectly. So the LS3 conversion into this thing, you don't actually need to change any of the power steering lines at all. It's absolutely remarkable. And another reason why an LS3 deserves to be in here. Fueling this engine, there's nothing too crazy either. It's got a big Walbro in-tank fuel pump in the factory fuel tank that used to house the diesel fuel. Now it's got petrol in it, obviously. That fuel goes through the fuel pressure regulator, regulated to about 60 pounds of base fuel pressure, then comes straight into the factory fuel rails, into these factory fuel injectors. Something that is fancy is this little dry brake fitting here, and that's so that during an event, after an event, before an event, whatever the case, the marshals can come over, they can put their test equipment on here, and you can pump fuel out of here into one of their test jars so that you can get tested if you're doing well in one of the races, a little bit too well, you know? Electrically, things have been really simplified because all of the utes are running the LS3 engine. That means that we could make a terminated harness that plugs straight into the engine, goes through the firewall, into the Haltech Nexus ECU, and we're away. But we've gone a little bit further than that for the Ute series. So what we're actually doing here, yes, we're controlling the LS engine, just like we do with all of our terminated harness kits, where we plug that straight in, plugs into the ECU, you load a base map, the thing starts and runs. In the case of the Ute series, we're also doing body control. And that means that we've also got second rows of harnesses that come out and they do headlights, they do tail lights, they do indicators, they do hazards, brake lights, um, wet weather lights, all that sort of stuff is all getting controlled through the ECU as well. In order to satisfy Australian circuit racing regulations, this thing needs to have a big battery isolator switch. So they used to be the big red key that would cut your main battery cable. That means that the battery was off and that means that all your wiring would be dead in case of a fire or an emergency. In this case, we've got a switch up over here, comes down to this master relay. So instead of having the big red key, we've got a nice little switch. As soon as you flick that, this battery isolator cuts out. And for all intensive purposes, the whole car has no battery power whatsoever. So you know that it's safe to approach. 
Over in this corner, you would have normally noticed a brake booster and a brake master cylinder, but things have neatened up a whole lot over there. Can't see any of that. All we can see is a bunch of braided lines that are going down to the brakes. So let's have a look across, see what sort of brake setup this thing's got. Uh, so there's plenty for the teams to work on to get their performance. There's um, driver technique, of course. Um, there's a, 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 a supercar style um, brake pedal box with bias adjusting. Um, there's front uh, and rear ride height adjustments. There's geometry changes that we can do in the rear end. There's a magnitude of changes that you can do to make these, to get yourself a competitive edge over your competitor. Now, the reason why the guys delete the brake booster and the brake master cylinder from in here is this thing's got a Tilton pedal box in it. It's got its own master cylinder for the braking system as well as the clutch master cylinder. Um, the reason why guys typically go to a pedal box, you get much better pedal feel and real race car drivers are much more used to that pedal box system. So they get a lot better sort of feel when they're heeling and towing in order to drive the car properly. It's no use in having that beautiful tilt and pedal box if you haven't got brake calipers to match it. And this thing does. It's got Brembo six piston monoblock calipers. It's got two piece brake rotors. Unbelievable braking on the front of this thing. Um, Keeping in mind that these things are going to be weighing in at upwards of about 1800 kilograms. So we definitely need brakes to be able to stop it. You might be forgiven for thinking that the brake disc behind there is small, but the reason why it doesn't look as massive as it should, this is a 20 inch by nine inch mag wheel on the front of this thing wrapped in a semi-slick tire. Now the guys are going for this particular Yokohama semi-slick because while it does wear really well, it does wear out. Being a semi-slick, over the course of the weekend, this thing is gonna wear, which means that we need the drivers to be driving the car appropriately, and we need the pit crews to be managing their tire program correctly over the weekend. This is one of the really great things about endurance racing, is that tire management is important, and it's not all about just that one lap, it's about going out there and being consistent for the whole weekend. Just like the engine, the rear end's also a controlled recipe. Underneath, it's got a bi-spoke nine inch rear end. It's got a Detroit locker style diff, and it's got horizontally mounted a shock suspension setup. In the tray of this utility vehicle, or ute, it's not too much different to any normal tradesman or tradies ute, except for a few little weird things. Stuff like the seatbelt clasps here, all they're doing, they go up the top here, there is secondary latch so the hardly doesn't come up during racing. If the latch here fails for whatever reason, it's a pretty normal thing to have. And then there's this rack here as well. These cars are run at a minimum weight of about 1800 kilograms. Depending on the make and model of ute that you're using, you may have to run ballast. And to do that, we put lead weights across these bolts here, bolt them down in order to get the car up to that 1800 kilograms. So tonight we're at Sydney Motorsport Park and we're doing what we call a shakedown on the V8 Ute. So what that means is the thing's already been on the dyno, we've tuned it, we've set up all of our engine protections, sort of about as close as what we think we can get away with so that that engine protection range isn't so high that we'll never reach it, whereas it's not so low that we're gonna keep hitting our engine protection strategies. So the guys now are about to put the thing on the track, we're gonna do a few laps, then pull the data logs out of it, make sure the driver's happy. We'll go and speak to the team, see what they want us to look at, and then we'll enjoy the whole night.
On a day like today, there's so much at stake. The guys are spending a lot of money to be at the track. We've got a bunch of guys working on the car and it is a real big responsibility to be looking through the data all by myself. So today, I've got Vaughan here. Vaughan works in the technical department at Haltech with us and he's here to help me go through the data, take notes from the race engineers so that we can both do things together and make sure we don't miss anything. First comment that was made was that the car seems to be driving forwards on deceleration, so maybe we need to look at the idle settings and see if we can drop down the base duty cycle. So coming into a corner, the throttle blade is held open a little bit too far, so in a street car we do that so that it's nice and drivable and between gears it's nice and fluffy. In a race car, the driver wants as much deceleration engine braking as he can get. So I'm going to make it so that the throttle blade basically shuts all the way when we're off throttle, as soon as it comes down below 2,000 RPM, back to in near the idle area, we're going to get it straight back to do the normal idle control strategy. So we listened to the fans and, and some of the, th the things that the fans wanted to see were loud, uh, fast, exciting, big flames, close hard racing. The LS3 6.2 litre is going to provide all of that. Alright, that was great. But just the response to this engine, uh, it's just like you're driving it with your feet. Compared to before you were actually driving the car, yeah, you're actually steering this thing with the, the accelerator. It's just it's so responsive. I just can't wait to get back out there in 21 and give it some. Inside, this is a really nice and tidy race car. It actually leaves the Mitsubishi Dash in place. We've even got the factory radio in there. Don't actually think that works anymore, however. Um, it's got a Pace Innovations roll cage that's done really, really beautifully. If you're going to be in an accident, this is the style of car you'd want to be in, I'm sure of it. You'll notice beside me here, we've got a passenger seat. So a lot of these style of cars do do corporate days or do sponsor days for the guys that sponsor these cars. So they'll actually get you out on the racetrack and you'll be able to sit in the passenger seat and do a few laps of your favorite racetrack. Made it to the LS3 engine, we've got a conventional clutch pedal, conventional clutch, and we've got the Tremec T6060 H pattern manual gearbox. So this gearbox typically comes out in anything that's a late model mus manual muscle car. So Ford, Holden, Dodge, whatever the case. If it's a H pattern manual in a later model car, this is T6060 is typically the gearbox that it came out with. Um, this one uses the Ford rear extension housing, it uses the Ford ratios, and it uses the Dodge Hellcat input shaft. That way we get the right ratios for the LS engine in this particular car feels really great and is super reliable. The ECU was a tricky thing. We needed a new ECU. So we looked at our options. Haltech to me was a nice fit. They've got a really cool new product out there that suits what we're doing. Um, so just putting the pieces together, um, a cool company like Haltech doing a cool project like this, trying to make super utes cool, it all just works. This whole car is managed by the Nexus R5 series ECU. Now, because the Nexus also does some car control stuff, so it does the headlights, it does the tail lights, it does the starter motor functionality, there is no fuses and no relays in this car. Every single function is done through the Nexus ECU along with the 15 button keypad up here. So if we turn the ignition on, we press the start button up here. That start signal goes through the Nexus ECU 
it decides whether it's safe to start the engine or not, then it outputs the signal direct to the starter motor, the starter goes, the engine runs, and we're away. We've got things like fuel pump and thermofan override switches up here. Now, the Nexus is intelligent enough that it turns the fuel pump on when the engine starts, it turns the thermofans on when the coolant temperature gets too hot, but we can also use these as overrides. And what that means is that, say for example, the driver comes back into the pits, pulls up, the car cools down, they might even turn it off, but before the next event, he might decide he wants to turn the thermofan on just to get rid of all that under, under bonnet temperature. Likewise, if they're back at home, back at the workshop, and they want to drain the fuel out of the car, you could go into that quick disconnect fitting or that dry brake fitting up the front there that we talked about, and you could put a hose straight into another car or into a tank or whatever, press the fuel pump override button, the engine management system will turn the pump on, pump all that fuel out, and then you can get fresh fuel for the next race. On the keypad up the top here, we've also got indicator buttons, which not so much used in a race car, but sometimes they can be really handy where if you're out testing and you might be doing a slow lap or you might want to be pulling in or something emergency is happening and you've got the foresight to quickly reach up here and press, I'm going left or I'm going right, just to warn the other drivers that something's happening could come in handy. Likewise, we've got a hazard button, we've got our high beams, we've got our low beams, and we've got our rain light, which is the light on the back, just to make sure that we're super visible if things get a little bit hazy and a little bit rainy. We want to be as visible as we can in this thing, even though it's bright yellow, we, we know we'll probably get seen. The one thing I'm really looking forward to is these fans getting on board with these things. You know, we've copped the flogging with the whole diesel platform saying they're not race cars, but I've seen this thing run and the way it runs now, it's a serious race car. And you know the best thing about this car? Someone like you or someone like me can get one of these things. We can collect all the parts. We can build it at home or we could build it at our local workshop. We can take it to the racetrack and we can have a competitive race car. Now me, that's bloody awesome. <laughs>